I was a communist for the FBI. Starring Dana Andrews in an exciting tale of danger and espionage, I was a communist for the FBI. From the actual records and authentic experiences of Matt Savetic come many of the incidents in this unusual story. Here is our star, Dana Andrews, as Matt Savetic who for nine fantastic years lived as a communist for the FBI. In all these fantastic years, fear was my worst enemy. The average man in the normal course of events comes face to face with fear only a few times in his life. But I faced the terror of fear almost constantly for nine years as a communist for the FBI. In a moment, listen to Dana Andrews as Matt Savetic, undercover man. Andrews as Matt Sabetic, undercover man. This story from the confidential file is marked The American Kremlin. An early spring afternoon in a large Midwestern city. The sun has found its way through the haze that shrouds the downtown business section and is drying the remnants of a morning shower. I decided to walk from my rooming house to the meeting at party headquarters, an unobtrusive address on an undistinguished side street. Cab, mister? No, thanks, Cabby. I'll walk. I think you'd better ride, mister. Three and four is seven. Seven is a lucky number. You're clear. No one following. Why the emergency contact? Two top agents of the MVT have been smuggled into the country. Their job to close any loopholes in party machinery. Who are they? We don't know who they are, what they look like. But so far they've been efficient, too efficient. Two of our New York contacts disappeared. There's a chance these agents are here right now. You see them, we want them. Now don't waste any time calling your contact. Anything to report? No. Okay, you can let me out. <laughs> Two top agents of the MVD here to check on their own party members. They're never sure of themselves or the people who work for them and with them. For how can you really trust a man who's a traitor to his own country? It's still rather early for my meeting, but there before me is the party headquarters. Outwardly, it resembles some of the other faded and forlorn buildings on the street. But there, the resemblance ends. For this building is the nerve center of the entire communist network in this section of the country. This is the American Kremlin. Comrade Barstow? Comrade Barstow! The door to Barstow's office is open. I walk in. Barstow? Not here. Beyond this office, the printing presses. I start to call Barstow's name. But the words choke in my throat. There, above me, dangling like a limp cord of an overhead light, hanging and swaying from a pipe which runs across the ceiling, the body of Comrade Barstow. I look around for the box or platform which he used to raise himself off the ground. But there is none. The floor beneath his swaying feet is clear. This isn't suicide. This is murder. Hello? Yes? Is it done? Yes. I 
stagger wildly out of the building, gasping for air. Sure, I'm scared. I didn't recognize that voice on the other end of the phone. Let's hope I wasn't recognized either. Why did I answer it? Call it an automatic reaction. A phone rings, you answer it. Just like you see a body swinging from a pipe and you know it's murder. Except in this case, there's a frame attached to it. And I could be the picture inside. I can't understand why the building is empty. The presses should be rolling a symphony of inky lies and some of my beloved comrades should be at the door. Of course. This is Sunday. And even a communist sometimes takes advantage of a decadent bourgeois custom. Like not working. I walk around the block and then I spot Comrade Kober, a local party leader, entering the building I just left. The American Kremlin. I wait about two minutes and then I walk back in. Who is there? Well, it's me, Comrade Svedek. Quickly, lock the door and come back here. I had seen only Comrade Kova enter the building, yet... Comrade Svetik, this is Colonel Polanski, who is here from Moscow. It is my privilege. Open the door to the press room, Comrade Kova, so that Comrade Svetik may also see. Pasta? Who did... Either my eyes are playing tricks on me, or else I didn't get a good look the first time. For there, under the swaying feet of Comrade Barstov, is a box... Yes, Comrade Sverk. Bastov realized that any weakness in our party structure is dangerous to the entire course. You may close the door, Comrade Kova. Comrade Sverk, Colonel Polanski has asked me to recommend a man to take Barstow's place. I have recommended you. I'm here to serve. When the revolution comes, our strength will lie in the instrument of the workers, the trade unions. Your first assignment, Comrade Sverk, is the shipbuilders' union in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. There's a train which leaves in exactly 40 minutes. You will be on it. Your contact is the waitress in the King Street Diner. Her name, Millicent Johnson. Comrade Cover here will give you specific instructions. Uh, about uh, Barstow. You have seen nothing. You know nothing. Wait for me, Comrade Svetik. I will accompany you to the station. Oh, don't bother, Comrade Cover. No bother, Comrade Svetik. Who knows when I may see you next? <laughs> He helps me pack. He helps me find a cab. He's too much of a help. He is right with me as we enter the railroad station. I buy a ticket. Look at the clock. There's less than ten minutes to train time. Ten minutes in which I should get to a phone and tell the FBI that one of the two MVD agents is right here. But how to do it without arousing suspicion on the part of Comrade Cover, who is being most solicitous and most comradely. Comrade Cover, will you watch my bag while I wash my hands? Sure, go ahead. Hello? Three and four or seven. Comrade Svetik, whom are you calling? Oh, I, I was just checking the time with Meridian. The last thing I see as the train picks up momentum and speeds out of the station is Comrade Cover standing on the platform and smiling goodbye. I've been cornered, boxed and shipped. Eight hours before the train arrives in New York. Eight hours before I can get to a phone, contact the FBI, and tell them the MVD agents have arrived. Eight hours in which Colonel Polanski and the hatchet woman on the phone could be in Dallas, Chicago, Los Angeles. You pick the spot. Station, a canyon of noise and activity. 
I disregard the porter with the outstretched hand waiting to take my bag and head for a telephone booth. I call home to my FBI contact and reverse the charges. Hello? What are you doing in New York? I'm on my way to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, replacing a local comrade who was killed. Details? August Borstoff, party courier. Murder made to look like suicide. The body was still hanging in the press room when I left eight hours ago. Be careful how you check it. I don't think anybody knows except myself, Comrade Cover, and one of the two MBD agents you're looking for. Name? Colonel Polanski. I think his partner is a woman. What's my Brooklyn contact number? Your Brooklyn contact number is... What'll it be, mister? Hello, Millicent. Hello, yourself. Brooklyn isn't near Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh isn't near Brooklyn. We've been expecting you. The meeting starts in 30 minutes. I finish here in 10. I'll get you a cup of coffee while you're waiting for me. What about a place to sleep? We have a room for you. Hey, Millie, I'll find some cybers. Brooklyn headquarters is an innocuous three-story brownstone a couple of blocks from the waterfront. A converted rooming house which boards all the local agents. I'll be under constant surveillance here. Is this by design or accident? Oh, Comrade Millicent. Come in. And this is... Comrade Svedek from out of town. How do you do? How do you do? Where is uh, Comrade Aachen? She's due here any minute. She, Comrade Smith? Yes, Comrade Hedvig Aachen, one of our most brilliant party members. Direct from the Stalin Institute. Are you discussing me? Ah, Comrade Aachen. This is Comrade Svetik. Where is Barstow? I'm taking his place. Comrade Smith, how did he get here? Comrade Millicent brought him. How do we know he's not an FBI spy? He identified himself correctly. Oh, so, but how do we know? Well, this is childish. You can check me whenever you please. I'm here to carry out a mission. Which is? The Shipbuilders Union. I'm satisfied. Comrade Millicent, you have contacted one of the union men? Yes, Hans Martin. He's been a party member for two years, and he's anxious to do what he can. Comrade Svetik, this is an important union. They are at work on some vital naval projects. So far, we have only been able to win over Martin. But one man in there is not enough. He will help you join the union. When do I meet Comrade Martin? He comes into the diner every day before his shift, around quarter after three. You be at the diner tomorrow, and I'll introduce you. <laughs> items on the agenda, so I just sit back and listen. I listen and look and catalog their faces. What is the connection between Hedvig Aachen and Comrade Barstoff? Was she the voice on the phone? There being no further business to discuss, the meeting is adjourned. Comrade Svetik, may I speak with you alone? What about? Alone. Come into the hall. What's on your mind? Why did you kill Barstow? What did you say? Why did you kill Barstow? to Dana Andrews, starring as Matt Sabetic in I Was a Communist for the FBI, and the second act of our story. This was it. Fear again. Fear projected by the cold, deadly, accusing voice of Comrade Hedvig Aachen. Why did you kill Barstow? I had to stall for time. The best defense is an aggressive offense. I grabbed her arm and replied... What did you say? Why did you kill Barstow? Let go of my arm. You're hurting me. Come on. Let go. Let go. What is the meaning of this? Come on, Comrade Aachen. Repeat what you just asked me. You fool. I said repeat what you asked me. I will hear it from you, Comrade Svetik. She asked me why I killed Barstow. Comrade Aachen, you place yourself in a very bad position with such a question. How many times have you seen Comrade Barstow? And under what circumstances? Was there a romantic attachment Comrade between you Smith, and... Comrade Smith, you exceed yourself. Comrade Smith, 
Perhaps Comrade Aachen's suspicions might be alleviated by a long-distance phone call. And you might ask Comrade Cover why Colonel Polanski recommended me. Colonel Polanski? Comrade Smith, I wish to withdraw my charge against Comrade Saint. Good night. <laughs> The next morning, I use an empty cigarette pack as an excuse to get out of the house and call my Brooklyn contact. Hello? Three and four are seven. Seven is a lucky number. Have you made contact? I'm living at local headquarters. Nothing to report as yet. Did you hear from out west? Party headquarters had a visit from the local building inspector, but everything was in order. Did they find Barstow's body? No. Was Barstow an FBI contact? No. Okay, if he were, you wouldn't tell me. Any other contact besides you? The shoeshine man outside the King Street subway station. Tell him you prefer a red polish. A deep red polish. Three o'clock, and I'm sitting at a table in the corner of the diner. And over in the opposite corner, a fat, paunchy individual blows the steam off a spoonful of soup. It's during my second cup of coffee that Hans Martin comes over to the table. Sit down. You're Millie's friend? And your friend, Hans Martin. First, we've got to get you into the union. There's a meeting of our shift tonight at 11.30. The business agent for the union will be there. You meet me at 11.30, and I'll introduce you as my cousin. Where is the meeting? In the warehouse off Pier 9. Don't worry, nobody will stop you. Just walk past Pier 10 and across the cutover, which you can't miss. Meet me at the entrance to the warehouse. I walk out of the diner with Hans Martin. Walk him partway back to the pier. As we pass the King Street subway station, I say goodbye to him. Shine, mister? I start to say yes, but as I look up, I see Colonel Polanski coming out of the subway. He looks straight at me, through me, and around me, and walks on. Shine, mister? Well, yeah. I I, I prefer a red polish, a deep red polish. Oh, well, well, well. My cab driver from home, how come? I had a feeling out there that you might be heading into something. I can't get over the feeling. I'm being watched. I sit back in the shine chair and let my eyes wander. Sure enough, across the street is a fat man who had been blowing steam from his soup spoon in the diner. Anything to report? Colonel Polanski. What about him? Can't talk. Being watched. Now, there you are, sir. Got the soup, please? <laughs> As I walk away from the shoeshine stand, I notice that the fat man has disappeared from the doorway. Rather than walk the four blocks back to the party headquarters, I take the trolley. Was the fat man really watching me? Did I do anything to give myself away? Oh, nuts. I'm falling for the old commie trick. But the guilty man will always worry. The innocent man will only be confused. As I start up the stairs to the three-story brownstone, I turn around and freeze. There, across the street, is the fat man. I shut the door behind me and run up the stairs into the meeting room. Ah, Comrade Svetik. Colonel Polanski. What is it, Comrade Svetik? You look perturbed. I think I've been followed. He's right across the street. Who? The man who's been following me. Look. Polanski and Smith cautiously move across the room and through a parting, and the drapes get a good look at the fat man standing on the other side of the street. (laughs) Comrade Smith, will you leave us alone? Yes, Colonel. (laughs) Well, this is no laughing matter. (laughs) Easy, Comrade Sverick, easy. I watch as Colonel Polanski lowers and raises the window shade twice, and then see the fat man across the street come up the steps and into the brownstone house. A minute later, the door to the room opens again, and he waddles into the room and smiles at me with the lower part of his face. His eyes can never smile. Commissar Turin, this is Comrade Sverik. Commissar, I'm honored. So, it is you who have taken Comrade Bastov's place. This is the other member of the two-man team from the MVD. 
This is the voice on the telephone. I watched you handle your contact in the diner, and I'm very pleased to know that we have such workers in the party. Good. Comrade Zvedek, what have you arranged? I'm to meet Hans Martin on the pier tonight at 11.30. He's introducing me as his cousin to the business agent of the union. I should have no trouble. Ah, my dear comrade, but the test of a good agent is to always be prepared for trouble. Uh, Colonel Polanski will accompany you. In the meantime, I suggest you get some sleep. You look tired. <laughs> At exactly 11, Colonel Polanski knocks on the door of my room and takes me down to the car he has rented, especially for the occasion. He opens the back door for me, and there is Commissar Turin. Well, come in quickly, Comrade Sveti. The night air is a bit cold. Comrade Sveti, you wonder why a commissar and a colonel should accompany you on such a routine matter. My duty is not to wonder, just to obey. Very convincing, Comrade Svetik. You should not have run out of the building where you found Bastov's body after you spoke to me on the phone. Oh, yes, do not look startled. It was you. And you should not have entered the building a second time and acted as if it were the first time you had seen the body of Comrade Bastov. And finally, you should not have called the FBI. This is some sort of joke. I don't get it. Oh, come now, comrade Spetik, spy, traitor, fascist tool of the FBI. Let us put an end to pretenses. If, if it, as you say, I am an agent for the FBI, how do you accompany me to my meeting with Hans Martin? Why don't you just kill me now? You have an appointment with him. If you do not appear, he will ask questions. Commissar, we are approaching Pier 10. Turn your lights off. Why was Comrade Barstaff killed? Let us say he served the cause. Served the cause? Yes. To trap any traitors in our ranks. And we did trap you, didn't we? I shall put it all in my report tomorrow. Moscow will be pleased. Bear in mind that Colonel Polanski and I are both armed. Now we shall get out and keep our date with Hans Martin. The shrill whistle of the tugs, a basso boom of the larger vessels are playing a funeral dirge across the night winds of the Brooklyn waterfront, carrying the coffin to its final resting place. You think you get accustomed to staring death in the face only. Where's that light coming from? Drop your guns! An FBI threat! This is my cue. I make a dive for shelter behind some piling. I clear my target. Find myself choking. The water drags me down. I'm choking. Gasping, fighting my way up. I break for air. And I hear the barking of guns punctuating the stillness of the night. There's an eerie quiet and then... Betty! Betty, are you all right? Just a little wet, that's all. Here, grab this rope and I'll pull you up. Thanks. Where are Turin and Polanski? We've got them. Are they dead? I don't know. The boys will find out. How did you manage to get here? We've had a stakeout on local headquarters ever since you arrived. The shoeshine man reported your contact, and when you got in the car tonight, we just followed. Did anybody else know of their suspicion? I don't think so. But I'm supposed to meet a party member on Pier 9 at 11.30. What time is it? Well, that's the 11.30 break now. Well, what do I do? Tell him you slipped and fell overboard to explain your wetsuit. We'll take care of Polanski and Turin. Well, what are you waiting for? As I make my way to Pier 9, the calm of the waterfront is as before. As if those gunshots had never been. As if Polanski and Turin had never been. But there will always be more Polanskis and more Turins. For this fight I'm in is a lonely fight. An undercover man who must forsake his friends and family for the false friendship of the comrades in the party. I must continue this fight alone. 
as I walk. Dana Andrews will return in just a moment. This is Dana Andrews with the word about the story you've just heard. In this episode, as in all others, names, dates, and places are fictitious to protect innocent people. However, party headquarters, described as the American Kremlin, did exist. And similar places will continue to operate in this country until we won the fight against communism. Next week, another exciting adventure based on Matt Savetic's experience as an undercover man, a communist for the FBI. So join us, won't you? 